Okay guys, a few weeks ago I mentioned something on a post on Google Plus and everybody started telling me they wanted to know how to weld. So you get your wish. However, be careful what you wish for because welding is dirty, nasty, you're going to get injured. If you do what I'm about to tell you how to do, don't be surprised if you end up in the hospital. I don't recommend this for anybody. But if you're going to do it anyway, I'm going to show you how it's done. So. Step one, we got to go get the stuff to actually weld. Let's do this. This episode of Geeky TV is brought to you by Full Sail University. All right, guys, we took our little journey over to Lowe's. Let's go in and load up on welding equipment. All right, guys, the one thing you're definitely not going to be welding without is a welder. So we're gonna start with that right away. Okay, here's what I want you to take a look at. We're at Lowe's, of course, so they might have slightly different models than some of the other places, but there are a few key points. We're gonna look at just these two, okay? First of all, you're probably gonna to wanna to make sure that the welder you get is a 110 outlet welder. So it's gonna have a standard looking plug on it like you have for all your other grounded appliances, okay? 110 is very important. Now, you'll notice we have two models here, the model 125 and the model 140. The model 140 is obviously more powerful. It goes up to 140 amps. So it's 30 to 140 amps of output range. Now, another really important thing to know about this is, you see it says 20% at 90 amps, that's called the duty rating. That means when you're using 90 amps, when you have it turned to 90 amps, you can only use it 20% of the time. Now, let me explain what that means. If you are welding continuously for every 10 minute period, you can only weld for two minutes out of 10 minutes, solid welding. That doesn't mean you have to weld for two, two, two minutes and then stop. But if you were trying to continuously weld, you would have to. So otherwise the machine will just shut off. That's why the duty cycle is important. Now, if we pull this one down, what we are really concerned about is what is, the, what is the thickest piece of metal that we're able to weld? And we can see that on the inside here. We're gonna use flux cord wire, which is called inner shield. And then we're gonna use 0.03 thickness. I know that there's a lot of detail, but that's the problem with welding, there's a lot of detail. According to this chart, with this welder, we can, we can weld up to 5 sixteenths of an inch of thickness on mild steel. So that should be plenty. We're looking for maybe a quarter inch maximum. We're gonna do somewhere between 3 sixteenths and a quarter of an inch, okay? So this one would definitely do the job for us Let's take a look at the other one and see if it would do it as well. Here we'll see this one is capable of up to one quarter inch. So for our purposes, you could really save the money and just get the one that's $419 as opposed to the one that's 524. But keep in mind that for other projects later, you know, it's sometimes, I mean, if it only costs a hundred bucks more, and you can go that much thicker, that might be worth doing. All right, so we got the welder taken care of. Other things you're gonna need, you have to have a good set of gloves. Not just cheap little uh, gloves that are made of cotton, you need some leather welding gloves. So make sure you got good, good leather gloves. Also, you're going to need eye protection. In fact, you need whole face and head protection. So you're gonna need a welding helmet. Now you'll notice we've got a lot of different models of welding helmets here, and they range from 22 bucks up to 100 bucks. The ones that are in the 20 to 30 dollar price range, they are just solid black screens. What that means is, if you've ever watched a welding show and you've seen a welder who has his helmet on and he sets up and then he flicks his head and it shuts down, that's this kind of helmet. And really, for for brand new beginners, I don't recommend that because you're gonna flip it and you're gonna move and it's not gonna work right. So what you want 
is an auto darkening welding helmet. So there's a range here from 70 to 100 bucks. And I'll show you guys some other ones later because there's some that I kind of prefer. But this is what you can just pick up at your local store. All right. So we've got our helmet, our welder, and our gloves. There's, oh, we're also gonna need welding rod. Now in this case, because we're gonna do MIG welding, we don't use sticks like you see sometimes. We're gonna use what's called flux cord wire, flux cord wire. So it's this little silver kind of thin cable and in the middle of the metal is flux, which is used for cleaning the metal and shielding the metal. It acts like a shielding gas without having to have a big tank of gas. Don't ask me to explain that right now. That's all you need to know. You're gonna get 0 0.030 flux cord wire to go with your welder. All right, the next piece of equipment we're gonna need is something to cut the metal with. So this is actually a DeWalt chop saw. This is my personal preference of brand. This is not uh, like a wood cutting saw with a metal blade. This is a metal cutting saw. And you'll notice it actually has a blade on it that's, it's, it's like a fiber resin kind of material. And this blade, as it cuts, is designed to wear down. So it, it really cuts through friction and it just wears down and then you change it out to another disc. So this is what we're gonna use for metal cutting, but now I know these are expensive, it's 200 bucks. So if you need a cheaper alternative, it won't be as fast, probably not as good, but let me show you what else you could do. Here's an alternative that some of you guys may happen to have laying around. It is your standard old reciprocating saw, okay? Now this one's gonna cost half as much, it's 99 bucks. It's actually a little more versatile because uh, you can put a blade on the end of this and use it for all types of other work, uh, including cutting of wood. This is the kind of blade though you're gonna need. It is a metal cutting blade specifically and you can see the picture here, it's got an I-beam, it's a metal I-beam. It's a bi-metal blade, so it's metal that's specifically designed, even says metal on the actual blade there, okay? So a pack of these and this, gonna be a lot more difficult, but cheaper, a little more versatile if you need to go that route. Now, we're gonna need one other piece of equipment that's right over here. We're gonna need an angle grinder. Now the reason we need an angle grinder is we're gonna be trying to, we're gonna be cutting, it's gonna create sharp edges. You don't want people touching it, so we're gonna have to grind it off. Also, I'm gonna teach you guys a specific method that I use for putting a really cool pattern on the steel. So we're gonna use an angle grinder. Frankly, I don't care which of these angle grinders you get. You could go with the little cheap one. Um, the, the, the disadvantage of like the little $40 one is, there's a switch and when you wanna just pulse use it, you're gonna to have to turn the switch on and it just stays on and you push the button to turn it off. So you see how that works? On, off, on, off. A little less precise where if you go with something like this Big Daddy DeWalt, it's got a trigger that when you squeeze it, it's on, on, off, on, off, very quick. So it's more efficient and it'll give you more control, okay? Other than that, you can easily get by with this. I've even got little $20 grinders I've used. They'll all work. All right, moving on. All right, when you get that four and a half inch grinder, it's not gonna have anything for actually grinding. You, you have consumables with these things. So what we're looking at here are all kinds of discs used for metal grinding. You've got really hard ones like this. It's kind of a composite material and that's used for just wearing down metal, okay? And then you've got really thin ones like this that are actually used for cutting. So we could chop off something, but although this is really dangerous, folks. Having said all that, we're not using any of those. We're gonna use flap discs. What this is, it's a disc that mounts on it but if you look from the side, it's lots of little layers of sandpaper, okay, going all the way around. And so what happens is we're gonna be sanding the metal, and as we do, the layers grind down, exposing new sandpaper. 
So the bad news is these are not cheap. One of these discs is $8 and they go quickly when you're grinding metal. So this is probably, as we do our metal working, other than the cost of the equipment, this is the number one priced consumable item that we're gonna be using. We're gonna get a bunch of those. Okay guys, one last tool that we really absolutely need for some of the projects that I've got in mind at least is a set of aviation snips, really just metal snips in general, okay? These are some heavy duty scissors that are designed to cut up to 18 gauge steel. So up to 18 gauge thickness, that's pretty good uh, thickness of sheet steel. And we're going to use it, oh, I'm not gonna tell you what we're using it for yet. That's a secret, but you'll see sooner. Soon, soon, soon. Um, one other thing too, that ju just so you know, um, at some point, if you're gonna be welding, you're gonna be thinking about wanting to put bends in things rather than always having to uh, weld them together at a 90 degree angle. This little tool is used for bending sheet metal. So you can put the edge of it in here and go like this and it will help you fold an edge upwards. Uh, that's good for, you know, putting 90 degree angles on things uh, uh, like we'll see with some of our projects that we're going to do later on. Okay, that's it for the tools that we really need to get started. There's one other really important piece and that is the metal itself. Let's take a look at it. All right, guys, we're looking at welding materials now. So we're starting with the cheap stuff and for a reason. This is rebar. Rebar is generally used as cheap kind of binder steel that goes in concrete. So if we were gonna make this uh, slab right here, we're gonna pour concrete and we're gonna put rebar down to give it strength and, and, and structural rigidity. But uh, in our case, we're gonna use it for welding because it's cheap. Look at this, one, one of these pieces is $1.30, okay? So I want you guys to start by practicing with the cheap stuff and then we're gonna move up to the more expensive stuff. So we're just gonna grab a bundle of these. I mean, get you 10 of them or 20 of them or something to get started with. And then let's go look at some of the other cheap materials we can get before we get to the expensive ones. Okay guys, I asked you to start with the rebar, not only because it's cheap, but because it's thick enough, it's just the right size for beginning welding. Once you get a little practice with that, we can move on to doing some crafts with nails, okay? Now these are just bright, common nails. You see they're fairly thick. You're, you can't get little tiny ones. The smaller it is, the harder it is to weld. So you want the thickest nails you can get, but there's one thing that's extremely important. They have to be plain steel nails. Notice these say bright common. That means there's nothing special, they're just normal steel nails, okay? However, some others say, for example, galvanized. You do not, you cannot weld anything that's galvanized because it, it, it is interfering, it's coating the surface of the steel and we just can't weld it. The other thing is you don't want anything that says coated. This is a coated sinker. Nothing coated, nothing galvanized, pure steel only. That's all we can weld. All right, let's go to the good stuff now. All right, guys, there is a large selection of metal here to choose from. Unfortunately, 70% of it we can't use. We're gonna focus on the part right here, weldable steel. Notice these others say, for example, this says zinc plated. We cannot weld things that are plated in zinc. We cannot weld things made of aluminum. That's a totally different welding process. And zinc, you just don't weld. Okay, so we're gonna focus on the weldable steel. And now, the, now is where the creative part comes in. Now we gotta decide, well, what kind of steel do we want? And you gotta have a little bit of some special project in mind, but I do. So we're gonna focus on one other thing. We're gonna get some various size pieces, but the most important part is we're gonna make sure they're the same thickness. So this one says it's 3 16 of an inch thick, and this is 3 quarter inch wide, okay? And just to be sure you're getting the right thing, it says weld steel, flat. So we can weld that. We're gonna get that 3 16 and we're gonna get a bigger piece here 
It's the same thickness, 3 16 but it's two inches. So we're gonna get a bunch of these two sizes and then we can uh, put them together to make something special. All right, guys, last thing to do is pay up. And then let's get to work. Hey, how you doing? Good, how are you? Good. You know, if you haven't noticed, John has the heart of a teacher. He loves to share his knowledge and help people learn more and become better at what they do. But he can't teach you everything. That's where Full Sail University comes in. They have an online mobile development bachelor's degree program that'll not only give you the skill set you need in order to pursue a career in mobile development, but also how to deploy those skills and how to market your application. Heck, the Project Launchbox program gives you a MacBook Pro already loaded with the software and apps you need and iOS and Android devices for testing. If you're interested in that or any other program, and they do have a lot, go to fullsail.edu slash geekbeat to let them know we sent ya. Now back to John. That was not a very good newsy send off. Now back to you, John. Let's get the welding. But before we do, we actually have to set everything up. As we're about to set this thing up, before we do, I wanna show you kind of the difference between the small little welders that we're going to buy at a shop like Lowe's or a big one that you're going to get from a welding shop. So this is actually my primary MIG welder. This is the Lincoln Power MIG 255. Um, and you can see it's absolutely monstrous. Um, we've got this. This is the one we're going to use today. It's actually on a stand, which makes it look even bigger. But this red part, that's, that's the whole thing. This sucker weighs 350 pounds. Primarily, you'd use it to be able to weld much thicker stuff. This, we can only weld in short bursts. This one, we can just weld anything heavy and just do it 100% continuous all day long. Now, the difference is a few things. First of all, uh, you're gonna notice this one has a giant tank of gas on it. That's because we're using the gas for shielding uh, the weld puddle, which we, the reason we bought the inner shield wire is because it's, it's a flux core, which means when the wire melts, the flux in the middle turns to gas and provides the shielding. This one, we're gonna use just solid wire and use a gas to shield it. The, the shielding gas prevents oxygen from getting into the weld, which would rust it. It would oxidize it right in the middle of everything. So this one uses a big tank of gas. Also, you'll notice this one uses a gigantic wire, and this is a 220 outlet kind of welder. Um, so you've got to have special plugs brought into your workshop to, to do 220 volt, where this one you can see we just got it plugged into a normal 110 outlet. So those are the main differences. Let's actually set this one up now. Uh, it's, you're going to have to follow the instructions a little bit. It's really easy to uh, attach the, uh, the cable if it's not already attached, and you're going to just set it up anywhere. I've got this little cart. These carts are like 75 bucks. You could build one of those later to stick it on. Um, but you're going to open up the side. They all, all welders will have a big door like this on the side, and there's going to be printing here. We'll talk about that in a minute. We're going to put our weld spool right here. This is where your spool goes. I had you guys, I told you get a small one, but uh, because I do a lot of welding, I've got a big one. So we're going to put the big spool on here. Um, in this case, we're just going to slip it right on there. There's a little white uh, adapter that goes on here for the big one and a wing nut. So we're going to put that on there and it's pretty tight. Okay, so now that the, uh, the spool is mounted, the next thing is we've got to get the wire from the spool down into the gun. So here's how we do that. All right, so we've got that there. There's a little um, screw, yours may be up or down. There's this, this little piece. You're gonna flip this down and this opens up. These are the rollers, and you'll notice there's, if you look really close, you'll see some little teeth in there. Those bite into the metal. So we need to get this wire, and it breaks really easily because, again, it's not just solid metal. It's got stuff in it. We're going to feed it in. You'll see a little hole on the back. It goes in that hole, and then you notice how 
it will start pulling right out. You see right here in the groove. All right, so we're gonna feed it through that little hole. You see that it's gonna roll right up over this other roller and, and through into another hole. So now I'm just kinda, I'm kinda pushing it manually a little ways into there just to get it started. But next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna flip this down and this roller presses and holds this wire against this bottom piece. This is the drive unit. So as we push that down and we lift this spring-loaded part up, now we're ready for the machine to feed itself. The end of the torch always has a cover over it and a tip. So you need to make sure that your tips match the size of your wire. It'll say right on it. If you have 0 0.030 or 0 0.035, you've got a little tip like this. So it screws right into the end. It's not hard to do, although you just got to get it threaded right. Here we go. So we're going to just kind of get that in there nice and snug. Now, eventually the wire is going to be poking out of that, but we need this whole thing to have the cap on it. So what will happen is as you wear these things down, they will get dirty and nasty like this one. This is still usable, but you see we just replaced it so it looks nice and neat. But you'll wear these out so they're consumable items. Next step, turn the power on. Now I know this is scary because you've never turned on a welder before and you're like, I hope I don't kill myself. You should be relatively safe at this point, just don't stick your fingers in here, okay? So we're gonna turn on the power and we're gonna hear it humming. All right, it's got a fan, it's ready for us. It thinks we might wanna weld, but we don't. We're still trying to just get the wire all the way through. So we're just gonna squeeze the trigger and hold it as the spool feeds all the way through the torch. Now, I squeeze the trigger, oh my gosh, nothing happened. We're freaking out. Now it kind of, it's going, it's not going. The reason why is really you should keep this whole torch cable straight, okay? Um, we've got it all bent up here, but when it stays straight, there's no friction, and eventually there is. the wire comes right out the end. That is all we're looking for, and just to prepare us for what comes next, we're gonna snip the wire off, because you only want about a half an inch to a, qu a quarter to half an inch of wire coming out the end. So we're just gonna snip that off, and now we're ready to weld. Stop right now. You cannot wear that or use that cheap helmet. I didn't buy this black leather jacket for nothing just to sit there and look good. And don't forget your safe face helmet. All right, guys, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna weld on this piece of scrap steel I've got. Now there's one thing I want you to remember. You've got to be using normal steel. You can use stainless steel, if it's really clean and you know that it's good stainless, or you can use plain weldable steel, you cannot use anything with galvanized or aluminum at all, okay? That's dangerous, so I want you to do this. This is a magnet. If magnet sticks to your metal, then you are pretty safe. That is gonna be normal steel that you can weld on, okay? So double check that. Now this piece happens to be pretty thick. This is heavy duty stuff, about 3 16 of an inch. So we have to set our machine to weld based on the thickness of the steel. We're gonna to refer to our suggested settings for welding. No matter what welder you have, they're all gonna have a sheet that looks like this. Now remember, what we bought was .035 flux core, which Lincoln Electric calls inner shield, .035. So if you look at our chart, it says, what's the process? We're using flux cord wire and the welding wire 0.035 inner shield. So this is, this is the line of settings we care about. We're gonna come over to 3 16 of an inch thick and refer down to that line for our settings, D3. Just remember D3. Now come around to the front here, D, is going to be our power setting. So the welder, if we had really thin material, we might be down here. But this is really thick, so we're gonna use D. That's a lot of current. And we're gonna use three for the wire feed um, speed. So when we squeeze the trigger, how fast it comes out. So we get on D, three. 
All right, now we are ready to really begin welding. We've turned off the machine because we've got the stuff spooled through. Now we're gonna talk about how to actually weld. First of all, I want you to remember, this is like a giant battery that we're connecting, where this little clamp is our ground wire and this is our positive. And if you connect the two together, current flows through. You do not want to be in between those two things, okay? So anything we're going to weld, for example, let's say we're gonna weld this piece of scrap metal right here. What we have to do is we have to put the clamp on one side, so we clamp it to the material, and then let's say we were gonna weld this onto here. We'd hold it here, and we will squeeze the trigger, and as the current passes, it, as it comes through this trigger, it will go through here, and then take this path of least resistance through the metal to the ground and complete the circuit. And as soon as I remove this, now it stops. Start, stop, start, stop. But I want you to remember, current passes through anything that's metal. So what I did, one of the first things I ever did when I learned to weld, I built myself a welding table. You're gonna wanna do this too if you plan on welding a lot. You'll see there's nothing special about my welding table. It's a beat up metal little old table, but it uses two inch tubular steel with really dirty, nasty welds because I made it a long time ago. So it's got the legs with wheels and a metal top. Now why would I do that? Because on this side, I welded this nice fat post that's so I can connect my ground wire right here. No matter what welder I use, I'm gonna connect this right there. Okay, that is grounded. Current now will pass through anywhere on this table out the ground back to the welder. So if I weld right here, as long as I have metal on the metal, it goes through here, through here, through the table, to the ground, and we are good. So now this whole top is a welding top. You can do this with any piece of nice, you know, steel. So just be aware. What I also did was two little posts right here. That way I can just hang a welding gun right there. So you see my work area now. If I'm gonna weld on this piece of metal, it sits on the table. I'm gonna grab my gun over here. I'm gonna weld. Then I'm gonna hang my gun up, adjust my pieces, and repeat. So that's, that's the process we're gonna go through. We're ready, we've got grounding, we've got our uh, spool through here. Let's get to it. Ah, one last thing, this is important folks, okay? Notice, I am wearing a little welding cap. They look like this, you can buy them on just look up a welding cap or something. You can buy them, they're real thin, they're cheap. Buy them on Amazon, I don't care. Go to your welding store, get you some of these or use a bandana, wrap it under your head. Here's why. Notice when I put my helmet on, on the top of my head, it's open. You see that? Well, the reason why I actually have kind of thinning hair on the top, it's from welding, it's not hereditary. I never used to wear these things, and as we're welding, you're gonna see sparks come up and stuff, sometimes worse than others. Those little things will fly up and they'll land on your head, they'll land in everything, which is why you need to wear a jacket and keep it all, keep you know everything high up to your neck. You don't want these going down your shirt, okay? So wear something protective, it doesn't have to be leather, but long term it should be um, and put something on your head because those flaming BBs when they land on your scalp they'll they'll singe your hair and uh, you'll be in trouble okay so we're all set to go we we have a piece of scrap material right here and we're gonna weld on it now so um, this is going to be the the part that's scariest for you a few things to know you're gonna to wanna to hold it about a quarter of an inch, no more than a half an inch, somewhere in this range over your material. And we're gonna drag weld. You never push, you don't, we're not gonna squeeze the trigger, start here and push forward. We're gonna start and we're gonna come backwards. Always come backwards, okay? So about a quarter to a half an inch off and you're gonna come backwards. Now you're thinking, how am I gonna keep it so steady? It's okay, it doesn't have to be perfect. 
and you can use your other hand with gloves on as a guide. So I can actually put my hand on the metal and hold it about here and use my hand as a brace to slide along to maintain the dis distance while, while you're practicing. You're thinking right now, but if my hand is touching the metal and all that current's flowing through, won't I get killed? No, because the metal wants to go the least path of resistance, which is not your leather clad hand or even your bare hand. The metal will conduct the electricity, not you, okay? So, hand down, tip near the, uh, about a, a quarter to a half an inch away and drag. So let's get that, let's do that. and it's gonna start welding. Now I'm pulling backwards at a nice slow pace and I'm trying to maintain the right height and just nice and even, steady as she goes. Okay, so when we inspect it, what we're gonna see is we've got a relatively straight line and we've got little ridges, especially after you kinda wipe it off. Keep in mind this is really hot, but uh, you'll see tiny little ridges along there that are in a kind of an arc. And the height of the weld is relatively the same. Now one thing you may have happen, we're in a garage with the doors open. Um, remember this requires gas to shield it, which is coming out as this burns. If you get a strong wind, it will blow the gas out of the way and it will create what looks like a bubble in your weld. Only way to prevent that is to close it off so you don't have any external wind. But this one looks pretty clean. It would be a decent weld. Now, you're not gonna do that, not the first time, okay? But this is the goal. This is what we're looking for. What you're probably gonna do is you're gonna be trying to concentrate on a lot of things at once and you will either go too low or too high or make a different mistake. So I'm gonna show you what happens when you do that. First thing we're gonna do is we're going to start welding and we're gonna to weld too close and we're gonna to touch the surface of the metal and see what happens, because I know it sounds scary. All right, here we go. We're gonna start welding just like we did before and I'm maintaining the right distance, I'm moving the right speed, but I lose concentration and touch the metal. Oh no. The first thing that happens, you'll see it sticks. My tip is stuck and you're thinking, oh, now what do I do? Well, just kind of bend it back and forth and it'll pop right off, okay? Now, when you do that, you're gonna notice you, you're, you don't have the right amount of material coming out anymore. Since you're not touching anything, squeeze a trigger, get a little more out. If it won't come out, just kind of take your fingers and try and scrape off that that material that's built up. Squeeze it again, ah, there we go, it's starting to come out. You can also use your pliers to kind of scrape loose some of the gunk. You wanna keep that tip clean, so always scrape gunk off, give it a little bit of a, of a feed, and then snip it off with about between one quarter and one half of an inch. No problem, now we are ready to go again. So. That's what happens if we get too close. Now, what happens if we get too high? That's what we're gonna do next. Okay, so we're gonna start our weld. We're moving along, but we're not concentrating. We're coming up higher and higher. And you hear a sound difference until you're just so far away that we've got this huge amount of material sticking out the end, like two inches worth of material and if you notice, you may have to go back and play this over, but you should hear, instead, when we did the normal weld, it kind of sounds like a machine gun. It's, it's a very consistent pop, 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 pop sound. This one started sounding weaker and weaker and further and further apart. That meant we were getting too high. So listening to what you're doing is as important as watching in the case of welding. So we're just gonna snip that off, no problem. We're gonna keep going. Okay, next thing we're gonna do is, we talked about the pace. This time, we're gonna go too fast and see what happens. Okay, so here we go. We're gonna start welding. I'm in a big hurry. Let me just go really fast. Okay, I'm done. Now, 
when we inspect the weld, what we're gonna see is we hardly put any metal into, this metal needs to go into this metal. We didn't put enough into it. It looks really blotchy. Um, the line is very thin. It's barely wider than the uh, metal that's coming out of here. It's just too fast. You can tell very easily by looking when you do too fast. Now, let's go too slow. So if we go too slow, we're just sitting here feeding more and more metal into it. It's just, oh, we're taking a long time. Now, it's not necessarily hurting anything on this thick material because we're dumping small amounts into this big one. But if we were using a thinner material and we kept doing that, we'd be depositing too much metal into it. And you'll see later, we're gonna wanna grind some of that away. So the more you put on it, the more you have to grind away. One other big problem is we're injecting a lot of heat into the material, which will cause it to warp or on thinner materials, literally burn holes in it. So I wanna show you how much heat we're doing, putting into it. What I'm gonna do is over on this other side, I'm just gonna start welding right here. And I'm kind of going back and forth and back and forth, staying in one area where I am just loading up heat into this thing. And I'm gonna stop and look how red, look how much heat it is and how long it takes for that heat to dissipate. Now, just because it goes from being red to, to being metal colored doesn't mean it's cool. Even if I touch that with my gloves on, I could get burned. You need to be very careful when you're working with this material. But remember, this is thick 3 16 inch steel and a lot of it. So it's going to spread that heat out. If it was thin, it would be warping and having all kinds of problems. So proper pace. What I want you to do with your scrap steel is I want you to just make several lines, just line after line. You're just putting a weld bead down. You need to do 50 of these lines until you feel so comfortable, at least two inches long each, until you feel like, okay, I got that down. Then next step is we'll weld two pieces of metal together. After you've done a lot of test welding, it's time to graduate to attaching two things together. So what I've got is just another piece of scrap metal. And by the way, if you don't have a lot of scrap metal laying around, it's okay. You can buy some of that scrap metal, you know, if you don't find some uh, and chop it up. Just use small pieces while you're practicing. So what we're gonna do is we just wanna attach this to this and we want it to stand up like that. We're gonna attach it at a 90 degree angle standing up, okay? So the first thing we're gonna do, get it in place, and we're gonna do what's called a tack weld. This is a tiny, tiny little weld that if we want to, we can remove the material by pulling it apart later. So we're gonna hold it with this hand. Don't worry, it's not gonna to get too hot. Put your helmet down, and then, now this is the tricky part. We're gonna start by welding to the bottom, and then we're gonna get it kind of melting and then move up onto the other. We're gonna hold it for about a second or two in each place and it will create a little weld, okay? So here we go. I'm gonna start at the bottom and then move up and it should be, up. Oh, I missed it. One more time, start at the bottom. Okay, we got a tiny weld on both sides. Now, if we want this to really stay put, we've gotta get metal from this piece flowing together with this piece using this metal as filler material. So we're getting all three types of, all three pieces of metal kind of uh, moving together. So what we're gonna do is, we are going to start on the bottom and we're going to get a weld going and then pull it up into the top material, then go back down, back up, back down. I want you to think about it like uh, kind of like the shoelaces in your shoe. They start at the bottom, they go across, and they move up each time, right? That's what we're doing. We're just gonna hold it there for a second or so and move methodically along. We're only gonna do this for maybe about a half an inch, okay? Here we go.
Now we've got that welded about a half an inch on this end. If I do the same thing on the other end, believe me, that is plenty strong enough for any two pieces of material you're gonna weld together. One of the biggest mistakes newbies make is if they're gonna put two pieces, they weld the entire seam of the whole thing. Not necessary, guys. You just need to weld enough that, you're, that it's not gonna come apart. So don't inject all that heat into an entire seam and cause warpage when you only need a little bit at this end, a little at this end, maybe a little in the middle. Feel free to make small welds all along it as opposed to welding the whole thing. Okay, to be honest, you now know how to weld, that's it. I mean, we went through what you needed to get started. We talked about what kind of materials to get. We talked about how to set up your machine, how to make a weld, some of the problems you'll encounter, and even how to put something together at a 90 degree angle, two pieces. What you need to do now is practice. You need to go through the process, set your stuff up, and practice making those welds. Run beads along a single piece of material, then stick other pieces together at 90 degree angles until you feel like you're really confident. And if you feel like you're good with all that, then the next step is to put it together and maybe make something a little artistic. So come back for the next episode and I'm gonna show you how to make a nice piece of wall art. We're gonna incorporate some other super special secret stuff. All right, stay tuned for more right here on Geek Beat. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't done it already. YouTube.com forward slash Geek TV. I'm John P. See you later.